All right, well, let's get started. Thank you for uh, spending your evening um, with us. I wanted to give you uh, an introduction to what will, how the conversation tonight will go, and then um, pass the mic off to my colleagues. So this evening, um, I anticipate Dean Shoba is going to be here in seconds. And, uh, and so we're going to uh, have the evening be uh, kicked off by him. And then uh, Greg Meyer is going to uh, say some words to us, linking Geisel and, and, and DH in that way. Then uh, Dr. Simons is going to uh, uh, speak from the perspective of the Office of Medical Education. I'm going to make some very brief introductory remarks about the uh, redesign itself. And then um, we wanted to make sure that we allotted most of the time this evening to a conversation. That instead of supposing what it is that you're most curious about and interested in, in discussing, that we would keep our introductory remarks brief, not brief in the sense that we mean to be brief and it's 95% of the time, but that it genuinely is brief. And then we have a conversation about whatever it is that you like. And we have 60, 70 slides worth of diagrams that that uh, we can use as sort of fodder for our conversation as needed. Um, and so in order to make sure that conversation is robust, um, just about all of the leaders of the redesign working groups are here. And so um, I'll make sure that I get you in conversation with those experts and leaders of the effort so that you're hearing it from the horse's mouth. So first of all, thanks for, thanks for coming. It's, uh, it's almost 6 and the Bruins are on tonight, so I appreciate you being here. You know, the whole, um, the whole purpose of the curricular redesign is, is focused on, you know, one fundamental goal, and that is to um, prepare our students um, in the best way possible. Uh, for their residencies and then you know for for beyond after that and you know having been here now for almost three years there's no there, I have no doubt that we you uh, and your colleagues are doing a great job in preparing them for the practice of medicine no question about it and uh, you know the reason I know this is is uh, because I, I know I'm familiar with the quality of the teaching. I, I'm familiar with the, the way our students compare nationally. I'm aware of their scores on the boards. Uh, and, um, and uh, you know, I just looked at the numbers uh, for the match this, you know, that we did a couple months ago. And, you know, if you take our top 20 aspirational peers, for, I think 42% of our students matched at what we consider to be the best programs in the country. That's really good. And, you know, there's a number of our students who would prefer not to go to the MGH or to Hopkins or San Francisco or what have you. Uh, and, and so they'll, they'll go to places like um, Idaho where they have a fabulous um, family practice residency. So that 42% is probably an, an underestimate, <coughs> underestimation. So the, the kids are doing great. Uh, when I travel, the program directors from not infrequently tell me that um, the Geisel students are very well prepared clinically. And I've even had them say, you know, when we, when we assign the interns to, uh, you know, their various rotations, we often put the Geisel students on the tough ones, you know, in July, August, September, because they're good doctors. So I'm, I'm very proud of that, and I hope you are. So the reason for the curricular redesign is because in today's world, we not only have to prepare our students for the practice of medicine, we have to prepare them to practice medicine in a very changing environment. And, uh, 
you know, I know Dr. Meyer will, will uh, tell you that the kinds of, and all of you will probably validate this, the, the kinds of changes that are happening are, um, they cause consternation, they cause uncertainty. Um, I hear regularly uh, about the, um, the difficulty of adapting to new practice environments, the uh, growing emphasis on productivity, the growing emphasis on, on paying attention to quality in your, in your own panel of patients, the growing emphasis on hitting cost targets. Those are real changes. And, uh, m you know, my guess is they're only going to escalate. Um, and, and, I, and hopefully escalate in the right way in, in that, you know, we want high quality care at the lowest cost. Uh, and uh, so our students have to learn about that. And they have to become conversant in a new language, uh, the language of, of value. And uh, they're very conversant in the language of medicine, but, but you know, they're, they're not as conversant uh, they, they, they start out basically not speaking the language. Uh, for me, uh, an important part of this is for them to be um, more effective leaders. So Tim and the team are building a longitudinal leadership core into the curriculum. Uh, we are not willing to compromise our commitment to professionalism and uh, um, you know, very important, I think, that our, that our young people be, um, you know, the best professionals in whatever work setting they're, they're in. Um, so, you know, this is not unique to Dartmouth. There's a number of places that are trying to take a stab at this and, and figure out how to do it. I, I don't know that we have all the answers, but I think if, if we put all of you together with the input that our students are providing us, we can put something together that's really, really good. Uh, you know, the LCME visit that we had uh, a couple months ago, that one of the messages I heard was uh, your students spend too much time in passive learning, you know, in, in, in a classroom like this where there's somebody at the front of the room, sort of unidirectional flow of information. That's certainly the way I was taught. And, and I, I don't think that's going to go away, but I'm certain that uh, we need to get more into what people call active learning or generative learning, and, uh, and that uh, occurs best not in a classroom of 85 or 90, but in groups of 10 to 12 or, or 15. Um, so that's actually uh, more faculty intense. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to have to address that. Um, but uh, uh, I, you know, I, and we will, we will address it. Uh, we're we're going to have to find different kinds of resources and the like. So. I think if we do this, it'll make the medical school distinctive. But the, I want you to know the overarching reason for doing this is, is so that the, I hate to use the word end product, but the, the final, the students that walk through that platform on, uh, on class day are, you know, they set the standard. Um, and, uh, you know, we're at a place where we can do that. Um, so that, that's the reason for it, and, uh, you know, that's the reason for um, pulling together all of you. I, I honestly don't, don't, I have ideas, but I don't know how to do it. Um, but I think between Rich and the team, and that, that we can put something really together. And, you know, we won't get it perfect the first year, but, you know, we never want it to be so fixed that it's not, not malleable and not, not changeable. So that, that's w why, you know, we, we want to do this. Um, you know, from a national perspective, it, from wearing my double AMC hat, um, 
you know, I think the nation in some way is, is watching us and almost looking to us to um, kind of help lead in doing this. Uh, they're very aware that we have this uh, unusual critical mass of people that have studied the, the flaws in the healthcare system for, for decades. And there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot there to be learned about unwarranted variation, practice patterns that aren't particularly effective, end-of-life care that is expensive and not particularly family-centered, uh, and we're well-equipped to, uh, uh, to do that. So uh, that's really all I wanted to say. Um, you know, I know you're doing this out of the goodness of your heart because you're committed to the institution and to the students, so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And, and I, you know, uh, I think the... The, one of the immediate goals that Rich has is, is to get the Medical Education Committee and, and the faculty at large to, um, you know, give us the first wave of formal approval so we can uh, move forward uh, with this. You know, one of the things I worry about is um, are we getting the word out? I, I, know that, I know the team has been going around to the various departments, but please help us, if, you know, if we're, if we're missing the mark there, you know, help us, tell us how we can do better, because we really need all the faculty to be aware of this, and not everybody's going to support it. Uh, it be, we're pretty damn good as it is, and so people will say, why are you trying to fix something that's not broken? I, I, I totally get that, but we need a large chunk of the faculty to say, yep, yeah, we're on board with this. I understand that we have a responsibility to teach the faculty how to be effective, um, not just teachers, but facilitators in this new model. And, uh, and we're trying to get the technology uh, um, up and going so that, that we can teach the faculty as well as the students. Um, so uh, thanks very much. So I want to, um, to take this opportunity to, to talk a little bit about, about support for teaching because um, this is actually my, my fourth town hall. How many people here have been to other curriculum redesign town halls? Good. Great. So, um, but, but before I do that, uh, you know, the, I think the most important message I want to leave you with is that in my day, as, uh, as Chip alluded to, th there are a lot of challenges out there. I mean, it's a, it's a tough environment in healthcare, and it's... It's tough at DH, um, it's tough in the Upper Valley, but real reality is it, it's tough nationally. It's just a tough time with a lot of change. Um, but I actually feel pretty joyous that, you know, the end of my day um, is, going to be, uh, is going to be in some ways uh, saved a bit by the fact that I spent the last half hour one floor below here at the Project Searches graduation, which is a terrific program that we do that allows um, allows uh, young adults with uh, developmental and, uh, and physical disabilities to, to gain a work experience and actually graduate to a job, many of them working here at DH, but others working other employers. It's just a terrific thing. And then this, because I have to say, um, you know, when you sit and have to deal with looking at, at you know, how we're going to make a budget and one of the difficult decisions we have to make about clinical services uh, all day long, it's easy to lose touch with the joy um, that is part of being in an academic medical center and part of being, uh, you know, a, a part of a medical school. Um, this, is, this is the joy. I mean, th this is the real, this is what we love to do. This is what gets us up in the morning and gets us excited. And so thank you for coming out and, uh, and thank you for your role in, in working with our medical students and our residents. In terms of kind of my view of this, I had an opportunity about four years ago to sit down with a, a group of colleagues from around the country and, and opine about the changes in healthcare. And we, we, we wrote a little piece that got published, and, and the title of it was Cottage Industry to Post-Industrial Care. And, and, you know, and at the end of it, what we, we mused about our hope, and our hope is that, that we really can make it through what is a really hard transition. And that hard transition is what is, what is the good doctor? And the good doctor when I trained was somebody who had an encyclopedic knowledge, who basically lived in the hospital and the medical office, who did whatever it took for their patients, always took charge.
we don't want to hire that as the good doctor anymore. Right? The good doctor today needs to be somebody who, yeah, we'd like to have them with really sound knowledge base, but they actually need to know how to access knowledge. They know how to use, need to know how to use new media. The good doctor is someone that we, we want them to be able to take charge appropriately, but we need them to work in teams. We need them to realize that they're just part of a team. We need them to be a leader, and boy, you know, what Chip said is so important. When you hear about the leadership portion of this, you know, there was a, a terrific piece last month in the New England Journal by Richard Bomer about clinicians leading and leading clinicians. Dead on. This is the curriculum. And, and finally, you know, what the, the good physician needs to do is the good physician needs to be able to embrace a, a different way of thinking about health care, about thinking about populations. And when I think about what we wrote four years ago and how a medical school could potentially get there, what you're going to hear about this evening and you've heard about before, this is, these are the right steps. It is really terrific and I urge you to, to work to get out the vote on this. Um, yay or nay, we want to hear from people, but I think that people take the time to learn this. Uh, I think they're going to get excited. We want you to be excited about this. There's one particular issue that Tim asked me to address because it came up in all the other town halls right away. And you know, how are we going to support this and how are we going to support teaching in particular? And, you know, I actually found it somewhat bemusing because if you look at your top ten and you, you flip it over and you go, to, you go to number three, it says highly paid clinicians will have their salaries reduced as a result of the curriculum redesign. I regret to inform um, uh, any of you who might consider yourselves highly paid clinicians and I have a feeling that there's not many of you in the room. but. Even if you did, I'd say the curriculum reform is the least of the threats um, to, to your current side. There's a whole lot of other things out there that are looming much larger in terms of the changes in the health system. With that said, we do recognize that as you hear about the curriculum, there are going to be increased demands on teaching. We have to find out a way to, to, to make that not just a sense of, of joy and meaning for you, but to make it affordable for you to participate in teaching. There are two ways that we're trying to go about that. The first way is you'll hear a little bit of tonight about this notion that, yes, we are moving to more small groups. That's going to take a fair amount of coordination. There's going to be a cadre of folks who need to spend a significant chunk of their time working on teaching, and they will need to get paid, and we're working with the medical school to figure out that there will be a mechanism to do that. But I think secondly and most importantly, um, I think when each of these meetings we've had, go raise a hand and say, you know, we don't pay for teaching. Well. To some extent, it's fair to say that if any of you have had a, come here in recent years, as I have, buried in your letter, the other piece that Leslie Henderson has crafted beautifully, it talks about the fact that, well, you're expected to teach. It's part of what you're expected to do. That only goes so far, though. And we are recognizing, I think, um, quite clearly that, that the current compensation system at Dartmouth-Hitchcock creates incredibly perverse in incentives in many ways, and among them is that you could you argue it dissuades people from teaching. If I spend time teaching, if I take on that extra course, if I spend a little bit more time in that small group, I'm not going to make my RVU productivity goal. That's not good for anyone. It's not good for the medical school. It's not good for DH. It's not good for our students. So we have just kicked off. We actually had our first inaugural meeting earlier this week and have another one actually uh, tomorrow morning, um, bright and early at 6 a.m., uh, of a steering committee that is going to look at how we compensate physicians around DH. So this is a redesign of our compensation program. Any compensation program is going to last about three to five years. This will be the fourth one that I've been involved in redesigning. Um, and I can tell you that this one will only last, I hope, four to five years. But what we're doing is fundamentally different than what's been done in the past. We are largely reliant on our current compensation system on productivity as measured by our views. We are going to change the model. And the model is going to change in, in three fundamental ways. The first way is it's going to involve all of Dartmouth-Hitchcock, not just Dartmouth-Hitchcock Lebanon, but as we try to think how do we extend our teaching out to community group practices, the compensation plan that we're devising is going to cover them as well. So that barrier in a community practice isn't going to be there any longer. The second one is that we're acknowledging that associate providers, MPs and PAs, are important parts of the team and, and they ought to fall under a compensation plan. We ought not to create incredibly perverse incentives. And the third way is that we're recognizing that w explicitly we're an academic medical center. And 
there are five things that many of us do in various amounts that ought to contribute to how our salary is calculated. And they go by the acronym of CARTS. What's your clinical work? What is your administrative work? What do you do in research? What contributions do you make in teaching? And what supervisory role you have? So all of us will have our salaries that are now going to be created by looking at that CARTS model. And so there will be an explicit piece for teaching. Is the teaching piece going to pay as lucratively per minute as uh, seeing patients or doing a procedure in, uh, in an ambulatory surgical center in the OR? No. Is research going to pay as much as clinical care? For most of us, no. But it's going to allow us to have a very transparent formula that recognizing that teaching is value, that teaching needs to figure into our compensation. One of the things that we've been working on, and, and, and Chip and I have had the opportunity, is we're trying to do some little things to bring DH and Geisel closer together. Um, and small things, like the fact that, you know, your Geisel IDs, as of about four weeks from now, are going to be able to open doors at DH, and vice versa. We actually have over, starting to overcome the ID uh, problem here. But there's a lot more deeper and important things that we're doing. We're going to need to fundamentally look at the way that Geisel and DH work together. And Chip and I have a lot to work on um, on that front. But the reality is we're going to get to it. We're going to work on it. We're going to figure it out together. But what I will say is explicitly, one of the things that's very helpful is I asked Geisel to make sure we have somebody who's representing the teachers. And so Leslie Henderson is actually sitting on the compensation redesign committee here, a small group because it's that important to make sure that we have teaching explicitly part of the conversation. And one of the great things is I think all of us can count on Leslie to speak up um, for the teaching roles. And, uh, and she's very, very effective in that way. So the answer is, is, can I tell you how much per hour or exactly how we're going to make it? No. We're working on all that. What I can tell you is that we are explicitly acknowledging that teaching is an important part of compensation, that we're going to get rid of the perversity of the current system that pulls people away from it. And we recognize that, that with all the excitement in this curriculum, there are going to be an increased challenge in terms of, of, of getting more people involved in teaching. But what a wonderful thing that we're going to be able to share with folks. So please um, you know, help us make sure that we've got a honed message here on the curriculum. Thank you to all of you who have worked so hard uh, on making what I think is a great, um, great initial foray into this curriculum reform. And please help us get out the vote. Thanks, uh, Greg and Chip. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about how are you actually going to do this. Um, I want you to have a better understanding of how we're going to pull this off. M my, my role as a senior associate dean, um, as I see it, and I think as Chip sees it, is uh, I have to make sure that we execute the plan and we, have, we deliver something. Um, the medical school has committed a tremendous amount of resources into this project. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how this is actually going to work and get done, <clears throat> assuming we go forward with a vote. So how are we going to get this done? So uh, let me just uh, remind you that uh, through CHIP's support and the medical school support, we have built a more robust Office of Medical Education. We now have Leslie Fall uh, starting out as our Associate Dean for Faculty Development, and she's really gearing up for a full court press for the next year. We're fortunate to have Glenda Shoup as our Director of Curriculum Design and Evaluation. So we have education expertise. Glenda has her master's and her PhD in instructional systems. So we have somebody with expertise in educational theory that can work with our course directors and faculty. We're also recruiting uh, a Director of Education Technology to help our faculty uh, use technology to improve, improve learning. Uh, we have uh, the Medical Education Committee that is charged with uh, overseeing the curriculum, making sure we follow LCME standards, that we have a coordinated curriculum, uh, and that we have central control over the curriculum. And then we have the, the redesign leadership team. I, I want to just acknowledge the hard work and leadership efforts of Tim Leahy. He's really uh, passionate about this. I've had the opportunity to watch him over the year, and I want to thank Tim for his leadership. He puts lots of hours of his personal time into this, keeps us on track, sends us lots and lots and lots of emails. Um, 
lots of meetings. And then these are all of the working groups that, that you heard about. So I just want to acknowledge the great work of, uh, of this team. And it's been really a pleasure for me to work with everybody. And then we have um, sort of the phases of our curriculum, the core biomedical curriculum, the healthcare science and evaluation innovation curriculum led by Greg over in the clinical uh, immersion piece. So how is this all going to work? How are we going to actually get this done? So underlying this, we have the Constitution. If you think about this as a revolution, uh, I would say that uh, Chip is probably John Adams working with uh, Tim Leahy, uh, who may be uh, uh, Jan ha John Hancock. And since I'm the executor, I guess I'd be George Washington to make sure we, we get this done. And, and so th this is the Constitution that underlies this. So we have our list of competencies, the guys of competencies. These are being redefined. Uh, for this curriculum. Uh, they're, they're largely the same, but there have been added some new elements to speak about the things that Chip mentioned earlier. And these competencies will have to be vetted through the Medical Education Committee and be approved, and this is where we start. I am envisioning, as we get closer to the implementation date in July of 2015, that, that I'm going to be recruiting a new associate dean for curriculum. Right now, we have Virginia Lyons, who oversees year one. We have Dave Nirenberg, who oversees year two in the SBM program. But we're going to have these two years come together in phase one. So we're, we're going to need an associate dean for curriculum who will oversee phase one of the curriculum, who will lead and support our co-directors and course committees, chair the subcommittee of the medical education committee, and will work closely with the director of curriculum design and evaluation and myself. So this person would be sort of Virginia and Dave Nuremberg combined to oversee phase one. We're not going to have a year one and year two. It's going to be a phase one of the curriculum. Here are the new course directors for the curriculum. Um, we have most of them appointed. Remember now, these are not departmental-based courses. These are courses that are highly integrated. And um, we're going to start with the Foundations of Medicine course. I've asked Roshini Pinto Pal to be the director of that course. But the subsequent courses are all the biomedical courses, and they're going to be directed by a, a somebody from a clinical department paired with somebody from a basic science department. So the cell, cellular molecular basis of disease, uh, Sir Chai Saputapone has agreed to uh, be one of the co-directors. Uh, the other one is to be announced shortly. The second course, Inflammation, Inflammation Immunology, a co-team of Tim Leahy and Paula Sundstrom. The Homeostasis course, which combines renal cardiology and pulmonary, will be led by Hal Manning and Gene Natty. Command and Control, Neurology, Endocrine, Musculoskeletal, that will be co-led by Rand Swenson and Rich Comey. And Nourishing the Body. That's metabolism, and uh, GI will be a team led by Charlie Barlow and Steve Benson. And the final course, the reproductive course, where we began repro and embryology, uh, that's still a work in progress. I hope to have those identified within the next week. So those are the course directors that will lead this new curriculum. Now, they can't do it by themselves, so how is this going to work? So this is an important slide. So you're going to have your two co-course directors who are going to lead a course committee. And the course committee will be uh, made up of faculty who uh, are representing some of the important disciplines and themes in the curriculum. So because these courses will need pathology integration, we need a pathology rep. We need a pharmacology rep. We need a physiology rep. There's some other disciplines that we're probably going to need. Uh, and then we have some themes that go across four years, like ethics and imaging. They're going to need a theme director. And they're going to populate these course committees that are going to design the course to make sure all of the appropriate topics are integrated. And these, these, these individuals we're going to have to meet regularly. Yes, the co-directors are going to do the bulk of the work, but they need to be informed by all these people. In addition, these course committees are going to have to talk to each other. So we're going to have to bring the co-directors of each course together for regular meetings along the way to cross-talk 
So we make sure that there are, there are not unplanned redundancies, that there is integration. So we'll have the course committees and then we'll have probably monthly meetings of all the co-chairs so they can do some cross-talk. Cross <clears throat> now what's the role of the Medical Education Committee? As, as these new courses get developed and are ready for approval, they have to go before the Medical Education Committee. The LCME uh, mandates that, that the Curriculum Committee, in our case the Medical Education Committee, is the central control mechanism for the curriculum. So they have to approve all the courses. The Medical Education Committee will also need to pay attention to integration, both horizontally and vertically. And this, this language, central control and coordination, the uh, Medical Education Committee will monitor that, but it's really our course directors, my office, our new associate dean, who will sort of be operationalizing this. Uh, the Medical Education Committee will also conduct their course and, and curriculum phase evaluations and assure compliance with LCME standards. And Chip said a very important thing uh, a few minutes ago. We're not going to get this perfectly on our first attempt. And by the way, these course committees and these co-directors, they need to continue to meet once the curriculum up is running because if we're going to have a coordinated curriculum like that, we can't do business as we are now. So this will demand these co-directors and the course committees working regularly uh, throughout the curriculum. And, and the curriculum will evolve, so these, these structures will, will be important. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of understanding of how this would actually be rolled out in the development stage and then in the implementation stage uh, so you get a sense of, of how this would actually work on the ground level. And uh, with that, I'll now turn it over to Tim and he will give you a few more uh, highlights and then we're going to open up for discussion. Thanks, Rich. So um, what, uh, what are some of the um, aspects of the redesign that you're interested in? We've been hearing a lot from many of you uh, in departmental meetings, in previous town halls, um, on the web, through our uh, frequently asked questions email. And, uh, and I wanted just to reflect back on a couple of the things that uh, people have asked about, because I think it's probably on your minds. And then let's just see what's, uh, what else we should cover. Um, so uh, where are we? What's the, what's the scope of this? Uh, you know, where are we in the process? So here we are. We've spent about a year designing the, the framework and the multiple pieces of the framework that we can go into detail about uh, tonight. And we, uh, in order to transition effectively from that framework design phase into the highly detailed course design phase, we want to make sure that our vision resonates with what the faculty think is right. And uh, so we're uh, coming up on uh, uh, both votes of the Medical Education Committee and votes of the full faculty. And so that's why we want to make sure the word is out there and people know what it is. Oh, is that uh, all my electronics interfering with each other? Oh, uh, good. So uh, um, Upon passage of uh, votes, when we get it right, then we transition to the very detailed course de design that leads in 2015 to full implementation. Um, knowing that we will implement the first year in 2015, the second year in 2016 in rolling fashion, so it'll take four years until the curriculum is entirely uh, uh, turned over. Um, we'll have these, actually, three votes. One of the Medical Education Committee, is this vision right? One of the full faculty, is this vision right? And then as Rich said, the Medical Education Committee has to approve in detail the syllabi of every single new course that rolls across the curriculum. So just as they do the course review now, they have to review every single piece of it. So, you know, boy, these things can each happen in the course of a day, but, but that vote actually is uh, something that occurs over the course of several months as they sort of take on each course in detail. I'm going to skip this slide uh, so that we can get to the conversation um, and just talk about a couple of highlights of, of uh, uh, what we are, partly to give you a menu about things to talk about. So as, as Rich said, we, we think about the, the new curriculum in three phases. We have the phase one, which is focused primarily on the foundational sciences, 
but importantly with clinical experiences with linked clinical training from early on. In phase two, we flip the emphasis. This time it's largely about clinical training, but with better integration with the foundational sciences embedded in the clerkships. And then we combine these two as students differentiate into whichever specialty it is that they choose, family practice, orthopedics, whatever it is. They take that specific sub-internship. They also have, as you'll see, a new rotation that sort of embeds the foundational sciences better. And that year is sort of better leveraged to make sure that they're more prepared to be leaders in the uh, coming years. And so here are some of the details. Rich mentioned that we'll start with foundations in medicine, a sort of welcome to the profession. These are the seminal concepts you have to know. These are some of the clinical skills you need so that you can be useful in clinic. Clinical experiences occur early. The, the integrated cross-departmental courses of the early phase begin. We have a phase two that looks in ways very much like the current second year of the, I mean, third year of the curriculum in which there are departmentally centric uh, clerkships, but there are some key differences that I wanted to highlight. One is that there are two new rotations, neurology and geriatrics and ambulatory medicine that are newly included in this uh, uh, sequence of rotations. That means that this is a longer than one year phase of the curriculum, and if you'd like, we can talk about how that's possible to achieve. We've run the numbers. All of these will have embedded core biomedical concepts in the clerkships as appropriate to that field delivered with collaborating teams. And then in the final phase, we'll have not only required clerkships and a specialty that the student chooses is appropriate to their career, but also this new integrated acute care course in which students see emergency and critically ill patients, ED to ICU, with embedded foundational um, uh, sciences. So the example I often use is that while they're taking a patient with, uh, say, an acute myocardial infarction and moving them to the uh, you know, coronary care and thinking about lytics and acute intervention uh, on, uh, to open up that coronary artery, they're sitting down with Alan Kono and going through a detailed discussion about the physiology between that uh, around their hemodynamics and why that, is a, that uh, anticoagulant is chosen and not another. And that might be done in collaboration with basic scientists in the, in the relevant fields. So uh, 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 Rich has gone over the different cross-departmental courses. And so one topic we could talk about is uh, how, that would, uh, how is that possible to teach all of these topics in small group uh, sessions. Um, uh, and so conversational uh, starters to, to begin with are um, uh, how much will clinical faculty be supported for teaching? You heard some about that from uh, 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 Greg uh, Meyer, and I wanted to uh, just sort of reiterate this policy because it's something that I've, I've heard some confusion about, and I want to make sure it's clear what the, what the guidance will be. So those who invest substantially in teaching will be given support. Support for basic scientists in large part comes through subvention. That is the medical school supporting teaching. Clinicians do not have that teaching support. Those who invest importantly in teaching, but at relatively small amounts, they do that as part of their faculty roles. Those who are course directors, clerkship directors, longitudinal uh, preceptors who really spent a lot, a large percentage of their time in teaching will receive extra support. The amount of that support will be their salary up to the NIH caps. So currently, I think that's $179,000. Department chairs are given the option, if they have that within their budget, to supplement that salary as they feel is appropriate. As you probably know, many departments have slightly different approaches to funding, and we have no intention of changing that approach. But that discretionary approach to salaries is, is uh, intact. The DH salary review is, is uh, ongoing, as Greg said, and we anticipate that clinical funding is going to be affected by that, and that in turn is a response to national forces, and that is not part of the curriculum redesign. And that's a confusion I hear that I wanted to underline, that there are changes in physician fat salaries that are coming as a result of national financial changes in medicine. It's not about Greg Meyer, it's not about Jim Weinstein, it's about national changes in funding. That is not related to curriculum redesign. 
CHIP has, has committed to f adding additional support to funding for teaching at Geisel. That is part of the redesign, and that is a good thing. Can we teach all those small group sessions? Can we, as investigators and clinicians, do we have enough hours in the day? So Rand Swenson and his group have run the numbers, and we can go through this in detail if you like, but essentially what we did was, what he and his group did was, counted up the number of hours in small group, in lab, in lecture, and all the other teaching contexts and the existing courses that feed into the new courses, and said that adds up to somewhere around 3,500 hours. That's a fairly precise number. Uh, in the new curriculum, we haven't designed it yet. I don't know exactly what the course directors are going to design, and so I can't tell you how many hours that is with precision. But we can estimate it because, as you've seen in the framework proposal, we've shown you what we think a week would look like. And so if you take that as an average model, knowing it'll be different from course to course, how many teaching contact hours does that imply? It's more, probably 1,700 hours more over the course of the core biomedical curriculum which really is the only piece of the curriculum that substantially changes the contact hours. If you divide that by the number of weeks, that comes out to about 26 hours per week, knowing that these are the courses of the first 18 or so months of the curriculum, so some of them occur con concurrently, and you can kind of see that the differences between the current and the existing curriculum vary depending on what the structure of the current courses is. How does that add up? It's about one to two FTE total. How does that occur? Existing teaching, teaching occurs, I mean, at the existing level, and then that is supplemented by this cadre of, uh, of medical educators who devote a lot of their time to medical education to help support the increased contact hours that are needed in those small group teaching. So say in, in, in the course that Paula and I would direct, we would have our course design team. Many of us would teach at the level that we would uh, teach in the current curriculum. And then this cadre of people who spend a lot, large percentage of their time over the course of the year would help supplement. They might be discussants as well as us. So if the dean can afford one to two faculty FTE, and Chip tells us he can, and I believe him, then we can afford this. How will experts and generalists, these people I've been talking about, collaborate? I think it's important to note that in the current curriculum and in the future curriculum, there are many, many faculty roles, and this is just a sampling of them, and I'm sure each of you can sort of imagine different roles that you suit that aren't listed. We in the current curriculum have to collaborate to figure out how do people like Roshni Pinto Powell and Greg Meyer and Rich Simons teach in collaboration with specialists, people who focus on HIV, surgeons, biochemists, what, you know, what all the different kinds of specialists. That occurs currently, and that will continue in the future curriculum. As you know, there are some topics, and I would say maybe the um, cell surface molecules that shape the immune response to HIV infection, that I could imagine there are probably three or four people at this medical center that they could teach that effectively. And if that's important to, for our students to understand, that's who should teach that material. I'd say there are probably 300 people who could talk with our, uh, teach our students effectively about cholesterol management, and they should do that. And so I think what we need to do is just figure out which, should, which sessions should be taught by which and, and allocate that, those teaching resources appropriately as is done in the current curriculum. This is challenging, but it's nothing new. We do this every day. So I'll skip that just for time's sake and just ask, there are lots of other things we could talk about. The master's curriculum, is that feasible to do in the course of four years? How do we make sure that's substantive? How exactly will that cross-departmental, uh, you know, sort of, how, could, how, how, how will my topic show up in that cross-departmental thing? I'm this kind of a faculty, how will I show up in that? What about ethics and professionalism? How does that get in there? How do we foster a practice resilience? How is it that uh, a topic of dear interest to me, palliative care, or geriatrics, or pediatrics, how does that get woven in? These are the kind of things we'd love to talk about, and so I wonder if I could get the redesign uh, working group leaders to come down in front, and, and then uh, uh, happy to uh, you know, talk as, as, as much as you want. Come on down. I think one of the big things that we wanted to get at in this conversation as the leaders are coming down is, is sort of what have we thought about already? What is it that we sort of feel like, yeah, we've got that dialed in and we really have a good sense for what it is? And what is it that we need to do in the coming years of the redesign? What, 
what, what are the additional details that we uh, need, need, need to work through in collaboration with you, and we're happy to sort of clarify that. So uh, why don't I sit down and see what you're interested in. Yeah, let's see what happens. Yeah. So Ken, I think I saw your hand. Yeah, one of the uh, competencies that doesn't seem to be formally highlighted for the four-year curriculum, curriculum is communication competency. Uh, and I don't know if that is supposed to be woven into the some of the other longitudinal pieces. Uh, Did you say communication, Ken? The screen's a little loud. Yeah, communication competency as a formal topic uh, that should be uh, would be considered one of the competencies that uh, could weave its way through the entire four-year curriculum, beginning in the first year when uh, when students could be asked to do more formal presentations, uh, written, verbal communications, assess their competency, videotape them, give them feedback, all that, so that that doesn't become the uh, a principal feature of the third year by itself, if you will, to, uh, <coughs> a way to intervene on. Uh, I would think that that would be just, uh, would help with uh, the topic of resilience, it would help with uh, uh, becoming uh, a better communicator as a humanitarian. I think there are a lot of, uh, you know, associated uh, positives that could come out of that. Absolutely. Um, I, I was looking around the room because I saw Nan Cochran uh, step out for a second. But uh, Adam, do you want to take that on? And can you use the microphone so that the videotape can pick it up? Sure. So, just turn it on. So, um, oh, that was loud. So, so I know that I've had conversations with, with Nan about this as well, and, um, and, and she's certainly um, planning to very deliberately include communication skills and um, strategies and, and techniques into the longitudinal curriculum of the, the first two years. And then my hope is that, again, in the third and fourth years, rather than starting from scratch, then we can build off on, on those. Um, there's a lot of different types of communication, and we've spoken about it before as well. You know, there'll be the very thorough first time you're meeting someone with a very complex disorder communication, which needs a very um, in-depth kind of overview, you know, full thorough overview, whereas then there's some follow-up communication or um, other sort of things which may be very focused or um, depending on the, the scenario in the, in the clinical field. Ken, and I would also, that's, you know, you made an excellent point. <laughs> We didn't show you the comp, that's one of our core, uh, eight core competencies in Geisel. And so <clears throat> we, we didn't show that, that competency, but that's clearly a competency that's gonna be integrated over, over four years. It, there's a lot of emphasis in the undoctoring course. I think we can do a better job, as you mentioned, in the, in the clinical years, but clearly that's a, <clears throat> that's a competency that we believe should be woven <clears throat> and will be woven in, in all in all four years. I also, uh, these, these modified um, case-based exercises or modified problem-based exercises that, uh, that will be um, a major feature of uh, phase one of the curriculum um, require um, interaction within these small groups observed by faculty. It's one of the major things that faculty will be looking for within that period to identify students that, that require more and also to provide an awful lot of practice in summarizing and presenting cases that, um, uh, that uh, are, are um, the, the subjects that students are working on. I guess I would wonder as to the expertise of the faculty I mean, there are, there are people who do nothing but communication still. And if, if, uh, if we think this is a core competency, how much are we planning to utilize uh, capable evaluators and instructors as much as we would be doing in any of the arenas of medicine? Um, and uh, should we approach that, this topic from that direction? That, that that requires just as much uh, faculty expertise and understanding as any of the other competencies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, one of the one of the things that's really uh, going to be necessary in all of this, I think, it's very uh, obvious to everyone, is a, is a substantial amount of faculty development. I mean, we we really, uh, I mean, that's going to be an absolute key factor in in launching a successful curriculum of this sort, and that's one component that's uh, um, that really is going to require a fair bit of faculty development. Um, I also wanted to say I'm here representing the um, uh, core and masters. The, the label is actually not up to date. It's now called the Evaluation and Innovation in Medicine. But we're, I, I'm sure, I'm sorry that I was late, but I'm sure it was mentioned. Um, but I think there's a good bit of communication um, which uh, will be represented here, not the clinical kind of communication necessarily, but scholarly communication and um, plus as part of the leadership and professionalism, the whole uh, theme of communication uh, 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 re related to collaboration, negotiation, uh, those kinds of skills that are so important as we uh, expect that our students will move forward in their professional careers. So I think that you were right to point out that there are many aspects of communication and I think it's great that we're hearing from people. So in case we've lost track of any of those pieces that we um, continually are reminded of them, but they, m most of them that we've mentioned are on our radar. I, I also think the faculty development pieces, of course, is, in, is important. But then um, within each field, I foresee there's different, there's gonna be a different expert in surgical communication versus family medicine communication. And so within each of the, uh, the phase two, the clerkship, so to speak, fields. We need to, in, we do need to find those faculty, you know, deliberately and and involve them and make sure that they are familiar with our with our syllabus and and contents that it that it includes everything that is appropriate for those fields. Um, none of the titles of the you know, seem to address uh, population science and quantitative skills, and I guess they go into foundations of medicine, but then I wonder if there's enough time allotted today. It looked like the time for foundations of medicine wasn't all that substantial. I, Brenda should probably take that one. Um, so that little stripe at the bottom of the figure that uh, Tim showed that said evaluation, innovation, in medicine, and I'm, I'm sorry that I don't know how much was said about it, but I'll bore you for a minute. There are going to be four uh, core courses that all medical students will take over their four years. They won't be sort of spread out homogeneously, but they'll be lumped. Um, probably most of them will be lumped primarily in the... Uh, uh, the, um, okay, I'm losing track of the label, phase one, um, but they will also extend through phases two and three. One of those four courses will uh, be called measurement analysis and critical appraisal, and that's going to probably the mo be the most uh, about numeracy and reading literature and interpretation and those kinds of skills. Um, and you mentioned one other thing. Um, oh, po uh, communi uh, population health will... Um, be represented, at least in part, probably elsewhere also, but in the course that we're calling Medicine in Context, um, which is about the forces uh, that sort of shape the way that we practice medicine, educate, um, and one of those forces uh, is going to be uh, relate to public health also, um, law, uh, history, culture, ethics, um, finances, those kinds of things. Chris, I know, um, you know you're part of a group around, I think you also mentioned quantitative sciences, and there's the other sort of uh, genomic uh, implication of that phrase as well, and, and uh, you know, I, I think taking advantage of your guys, uh, you know, expertise would be great right in that, that specific course. Paula. This is a question for anybody, but if you were doing your faculty, we just hired you and you're trying to get an R1 and get your career going and you want to do the promotion ladder, what would worry you most about what's being proposed? Because it sounds like the, the committees have done an astounding job of thinking about what will be given to students, but especially because we struggle with junior faculty in the current system, what are the red flags that we would want to be asking you about? Because you're asking for a little bit more time, but time structured differently and people to reach and, and grow. 
uh, in this, uh, in this uh, new process? If, if I were a junior faculty member, I would make sure that uh, I had a careful conversation with my chair and division chief about uh, expectations for promotion and given the, the talents of that individual, where, they, where could they be most effective in the curriculum and how much time do they have in the curriculum? So if they're a new faculty member and they're worried about getting their grants, perhaps they're not gonna be a core small group facilitator, but they, they may wanna give some lectures in a, in, in a course. Um, so I think it depends upon what they wanna do, what their talents are, how much research time they have, and I think that requires careful uh, counseling and mentorship by the chair or, or, or division chief. Rand, you're a chair, maybe you should chime in. Um, I, 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 you're, you're right um, that um, often junior faculty can um, um, have some trouble sorting out where priorities are, but I mean that that's really one of the critical roles of, of, of chairs. It's one of the critical roles of mentoring groups. Um, the uh, um, th there are um, additional um, resources f that help in faculty development, and no one's going to be forced into doing more than the occasional lecture if they don't want to and if it's not part of their their career tra trajectory certainly the person that's doing clinical you know primarily clinical and trying to do research at the same time is probably going to have a very limited amount of time to invest in this um, it'll I think this new curriculum will afford a wider array of opportunities and more support for those individuals that really have that as a major part of their 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 career goals um, and that's one of the reasons it's exciting, um, exciting to me. But um, but it's going to require a fair bit of mentorship. You're right. I have another question. How, how, long, how many do you think of the people that are getting a master's are going to finish in four years versus five years? Because you know, if they finish in five years, then it's sort of beneficial because then they can work in lab. But they, you know, there could be some benefit back to the faculty to having. Uh, so I think that's a really good question. And um, when we were handed the job of coming up with a master's in four years, that was one of the first things that we said is, will everyone want to do it in four years? And um, I think the answer to that is clearly going to be no. Um, and I, as I currently understand it, we are going to allow um, students to do it over a longer period of time. Um, recently, we were able to work with a uh, Tuck first year project group who did work uh, looking at our quote unquote customers, I hate that term, um, uh, including uh, prospective future prospective medical students as well as residency program directors. Um, and one of the things that we were looking at was what their conception of this master's program plan was. And there was definitely a, a number who were concerned about packing it all into four years. I could not begin to guess what the breakdown will be. I think we're anticipating that in the first year of the program that only approximately a quarter of students, tw maybe on the order of 20 students, will even pursue the masters. Um, and I don't know the breakdown beyond that of how many will try to do it. We're going to uh, make it possible in four years. I believe that. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Uh, one, th one thing, though, to remember is that we have a fairly substantial percentage of our students right now do the medical degree in four years, uh, five years. So it's, uh, so, you know, that, the opportunity to do it in, in four years, we're trying to create, but there will be many that take, take five. Are, are we still going to maintain the MD-PhD option? And if so, how does that uh, fit in? Yeah, absolutely. We have a, a <clears throat> sizable proportion of our uh, graduating class that get some dual degree, PhD, MBA, uh, MPH, et cetera, and it's very important to us to maintain that flexibility. The opportunity to have dual degree programs is partly what attracts students. 
this master's attracts a different set of students that previously didn't have the opportunity to get a master's there. But yeah, it's very important to us to, to uh, build that in. So for instance, we're meeting with Jim Gorham actually, I think like in a week and a half or something like that to discuss the specific logistics, but there, we've already sort of looked at the schedule and that should be a pretty easy transition. One, one um, I was thinking about your question, Paula, and, and um, thinking that it touches on a, a particular communication dynamic that I've heard from people one-on-one, -on -one, but not heard expressed in big rooms, and I was thinking it might be uh, helpful to, to bring it out. And that has uh, to do with the idea of funding for uh, this small cadre of, uh, of medical educators who will uh, support the teaching in the core biomedical curriculum. And uh, there's been this conversation about whether that is some exclusive dedication of medical education funds to a star chamber, uh, some people hidden off in the corners who are sort of taking all the money for themselves for, for teaching. And uh, I think it is true that there would be an emphasis of money on those people as opposed to sort of taking the total medical education budget and dividing it by the number of faculty and allocating uh, you know, equally there is this presumption that because faculty have many different activities, and some have busy clinics, and some have busy research lives, and some have both, and, and how do we uh, uh, facilitate their ability to still teach, but not have their lives sort of be taken over by that? And certainly, you know, my advice to a junior faculty member who was trying to get a K and then an R would be don't take on a massive teaching responsibility. This small group of educators is designed specifically to address that question. And we brought out this curriculum, I think one question a lot of faculty had was, how are we gonna do this? We're already so busy. And the answer is, you're gonna keep on teaching the way you keep on teaching to the degree that you want, and these people will help fill in so that you don't have to have your grant overshadowed. So I'm hoping it's understood in that way instead. Let me just uh, add on to that. So I had a conversation recently with Steve Benson, <clears throat> who's agreed to be one of the co-directors for the GI Block. And he said, you know, I really would like to be a, a small group uh, facilitator. <clears throat> but he said, I, the course runs, <clears throat> I don't know, eight weeks or 12 weeks. I forget exactly how long it lasts. He said, I, I can't envision <clears throat> for 12 weeks doing this. How about one of my partners and I sort of split that? And I'll do the first half and they do the second half. And, you know, I said, that seems pretty reasonable to me. Let's see what the curriculum redesign team thinks. Let's think with the medical education team. So <clears throat> I think that there'll be room for <clears throat> content experts to be small group facilitators. I think there'll be room for people like me who are general internists to be small group facilitators. Um, uh, and so we, we would like a mixture of faculty to be involved in the small group teaching. So it won't be an exclusive club that's sort of just doing all the small group teaching. Yeah, Paula. I was just wondering, uh, sort of a nuts and bolts question in terms of how, you know, what, what's going to really motivate the students to be there? I mean, currently there's kind of culture of, you know, well, I don't think I really need to go to lecture. Maybe I don't need to go to my small group. Um, what sort of <coughs> tests am I going to have? Or, you know, I'm just wondering what the motivational things is. Or maybe if we just have this beautiful new design, which was really looking good, that that's just like a, that's going to be a non-issue, but I'm just wondering. You know, I think it's tied to assessment and uh, as well as other things. And how's how's that going to work? I guess is what I'm wondering. Well, Paul, I think first of all, um, <laughs> these small group sessions will be required. Uh, the lectures right now, and I think for the future, lec students can listen to their Echo 360, and they may many have different learning styles. So. But these small groups will be required. But you know, uh, at my former institution, we had a case-based curriculum since 1997. I facilitated, I think, every single organ system block as a PBL facilitator. The students, they liked coming to PBL because they, they it was fun for them. They, they, they learned a lot in those settings, and they weren't learning passively. They were interacting with, with each other. So. Hopefully this will be an exciting curriculum and 
They'll come because it's required, but they'll also come because they, they enjoy that type of learning. And then how did you assess small group performance? Uh, so there's many ways to do it, but there's, there are standard evaluation sheets that can assess students for their ability to interact in a, in a team, to show respect for one another. You can, you can evaluate how they do in generating hypothesis, how they contribute to group discussion, their professionalism, are they arriving on time? And so there's a number of competences that we can evaluate in the uh, problem case-based learning other than just simple content knowledge. Mm -hmm. And how's the content knowledge evaluated? Uh, so I'll let, I'll let Tim talk about this, or who else wants to talk about the evaluation system? Well, I mean, every, every place does it a little bit differently, but the same, but uh, I mean, it can range anything from using the same kind of exams that we currently use, which are kind of loosely modeled on national board, to national board shelf exams, to all essay exams, which actually are quite attractive because they can, they can mirror knowledge objectives in, in, um, in course objectives much, uh, much better, though, of course, they would have to be incredibly carefully designed so that they could be, so that they can be graded, which is the big problem with those kind of tests. Um, I was at Case Western a um, few weeks ago, and um, that's how all of their exams are for 164 students. Um, they're all um, th very carefully crafted essay exams. Um, and, uh, and, but that doesn't have to be that way. Well, one thing that's nice about the capstones is that students have to take responsibility for different, you know, so if you give them responsibility, then they're, you know, they're going to be more engaged. There, I, I can say, having been at Hofstra and, and Case and Rochester, where they do a lot of this as well, and observing these, these small group case-based um, uh, experiences, students are incredibly engaged. And, um, and they really seem to be enjoying themselves a lot. And, and actually, the literature on these kind of um, exercises are that uh, students um, um, are more motivated by them. Uh, these kind of the, these kind of interactive exercises that they're that are really student led in many ways with faculty guidance, of course. I was just talking with uh, Paula before this about a f funny experience she and I were having in parallel, where both of us were teaching Geisel students in part of the day and Dartmouth College students in part of the day concurrently. And so the Geisel students are, of course, the cream of the crop of the Dartmouth College types. And yet, we'd come into the Dartmouth, co and, and Carl, don't tell anybody I said this, OK? We, we'd, we'd come into the Geisel students, and it's a little difficult to get them to engage sometimes. And they're a little grumpy, right? And, and uh, Cindy, I'm trusting you here. You, you go to the college students, they are fired up asking questions. It's difficult for me to manage time in class because there are so many questions coming at me, very conceptual, very bright. And I th our students are brighter. But I think what happens is we take those enthusiastic students and we whack them with a stick over and over again. They just get pummeled with facts. So they lose that motivation. So I, I agree with you. I think that we, they have to learn a lot. It's not negotiable, but I think we need to teach them more effectively so they don't lose that capacity because you know you get these guys in a learning context and they just it's like they're blossoming they're waking up again so I'm I'm looking forward to when we can all teach to fired up students again so I guess how how are you guys how's this uh, to borrow a phrase from chip how's this showing up for you guys or what are you hearing from your peers what are the you know, are there sort of messages that we need to get out more clearly, things that people aren't clear about or worried about or whatever? I'd love to make sure we're, you know, I think if people sort of feel like, yeah, I get it, we're bored, that's nice. But if people are not understanding or worried about something, I'd love to engage them in, in dialogue. So what, what are you guys hearing about this? Well, I think uh, the faculty are, um, that I know are, are really sort of uncertain about what this is all about and uh, 
some of us met with Rand a couple weeks ago, and I just remember one comment was after this whole long meeting, since Emma, our, our course with our different subtopics, and one person said, well, the thing about this is that I'm still thinking of this as a purple box. And that bothers me, because it was a purple box in the diagram. <laughs> and it's like, after all this, he still was having difficulty figuring out what his role would be. And I think they're all having that, that difficulty. And when you talk about it, it's like, you know, I, I just think it's, a, it's kind of a blank screen for them. Um, and I, I mean, maybe they should be here, that's something or, but somehow they're just not sure, you know, how they're going to fit into it, what they're going to do. Why should I vote for this is sort of what they're thinking. Um, so I, I don't know exactly what to do about that. I guess you don't have to know the answer when you know there's a problem, but I think, you know, there's more we could do there. I think you're putting your, your finger on one of the, the key communications challenges here is that Essentially, I think we're sort of asking the faculty, would you like us to design a car or a motorcycle or a truck? And I think the faculty's response has been upon occasion, well, how many wheels are you going to design? And, and I'm, I'm sort of saying, well, I need Paula to design that vehicle. I, I need Surachai to design that vehicle. I need Rand to design that vehicle. But what we're asking is, is, is it okay if it's a car? And uh, I, think, I think partly people are sort of saying, well, so how many mirrors? How many wheels? Well, can I, get a, can I design a car? <laughs> I, think is the, I think that's the big question. And, and uh, so tips on how to, how to bridge that gap would be much appreciated. Yeah, Paula. I don't know if Brenda may have a different comment, but at the VA, I don't think it's as big a picture. Well, you know, we're federal employees, we're slackers, right? <laughs> but uh, I, I think perhaps having a sense of how this is going to play out for VA faculty is important. I would echo the other Paula's comments, however, uh, that I think many people don't have a sense of really what this means for them. You had some slides, some of them that you moved through quickly about what this means for me, that kind of stuff. I, I think you, there's a, a vagueness about what it would translate to, even if we can understand how the teaching would happen for students, how it would change our lives. And, and I would say more cases or examples, helping people think that through would be helpful. All right. I haven't had a chance to talk to the surgical faculty a lot about this, uh, even as my role as a member of the faculty council. I'm supposed to talk to them tomorrow morning about it. Uh, but I don't get a lot of um, uh, energy out of the surgical faculty, uh, and my wonder is that because the faculty don't feel that they get a lot of energy out of the students, and I, and I, and I would um, you know, reflect on what you said earlier, uh, that if the new system results in energized students, I think that will energize the faculty also. So it's a little hard to know when you want that energy <laughs> or when it will appear. Uh, uh, you know, there are some that will try to provide it regardless, but uh, it may be that as the new curriculum gets implemented and there's just more excitement, then the other faculty will want to get more engaged at that point rather than in, in the design process, if you will. Ken, you, you made a good point. Um, I was meeting with Rich Freeman uh, with, and John Dick uh, earlier this week, and there's a new pilot that's going to come out for the undoctoring students this year that will mean that <clears throat> one out of every one half day a week out of every month, instead of going to a primary care physician's office, they will have an opportunity to go to the surgeon's office. And Nan Cochran approached Rich Freeman about his surgical faculty having these students in the clinic, and Rich said, the response of the surgeons was amazing. They were, they were lining up to take students because Rich said they're excited to have students and so here's an opportunity for the surgical colleagues in the new curriculum because on the, on the undoctoring program, rather than every other week, the students will be going to a clinic one half day every week and one out of those four will be with a specialist like a surgeon. So I think as your faculty get more contact with the students and they become energized with the students and the students you know love those experiences i think that'll that'll work both both ways
So one thing, Paula, to touch on uh, what you said, this idea of giving some examples, I think is a great idea. It's been a frequent topic of conversation in our leadership group is, you know, we can't design the curriculum until we're given leave to, to design the curriculum. But if we sort of showed in great detail a week in the core biomedical curriculum and, and how that might look so that a, a particular faculty member could sort of see themselves on Tuesday at 10 a.m., uh, make that leap a little bit. What, how, how might the foundational sciences be built into a clerkship? Just a particular week. Give some examples and maybe that would give people a sense of, yeah, that, and now I can see how, the, how I can interface with the students in a new way. So we can, we can work on that. Well, um, I wanted to say thank you to the curriculum redesign leadership. R Rich is right that uh, I pummel them with emails. We pummel each other pretty well with emails, I think. Um, but these, these guys are really, um, they're not phoning it in. They're spending their weekends and their evenings away from family working hard on this stuff. And I, you know, feel honored to, to sit up here with them. And, and, and I, I, I'm proud of the efforts that you guys have put into it. And I really appreciate you guys doing the same thing and taking the time to give us your thoughts and sort of engage around this. And if as you reflect about this, you know, you have ideas or other things that just didn't come out tonight, we'd love it if you reach out. You can email any of us individually. There's the curriculum redesign webpage that has a, an email address that gets the stuff to where it needs to go. So definitely let us know how we can reach you and we'd uh, be happy to, happy to, happy to do it. Uh, Chip? I think Ken's question is, you know, it's a good one. And, you know, if you're a student who, you know, knows you're going to go into pediatrics, you, you may not get as excited about the surgery rotation. Uh, but hopefully we can get the faculty to the point where they, you know, take some level of pride in the, um, the quality of the student that graduates from the Geisel School of Medicine. So um, let, let me share with you what, what, what I consider to be one of my big responsibilities in, in all of this because it, it's, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take resources. So to my way of thinking, um, and, and I, think, I think there's... Yeah, just best for that in video too. No, I don't know. Folks at home. To, um, <laughs> I think you can cut this a number of ways, but if you look at the healthcare system from the 50,000 foot level, you could say, um, or let me say, the, the way I've come at it is, is to ask, what's not working with the healthcare system? Or if you want to be more um, crude about it, where is the healthcare system broken? And um, and, I, and I would argue it, it's kind of broken in four fundamental ways, the f the f the, and in no particular order. So um, one, way, one place it's broken is the way that we deliver care it is, um, is not sustainable. It, it's, it, it's too expensive. Um, but m much of the care that we provide to patients today is not evidence-based care. And much of the care that we provide is unnecessary care. Um, and uh, so I think our students need to be really well educated in that space. Now here we, you know, we call that healthcare delivery science, right? So that, that was the rationale for one of these master's tracks. You know, when this thing gets, gets fully mature and five, eight years, uh, that would be one of the tracks that students could select. Uh, the master's is optional. Uh, hopefully it'll be so cool that, that they'll all want to do it. The second place where you could say the healthcare system is, is not working uh, is, is the way we're uh, e educating uh, students. And you know, it's not just students, it's residents. And, and the way to think about that is as is, is follows. So the way I think about it is, it's impossible to reform the healthcare system if you don't at the same time reform the educational system. So we've got to educate differently. Um, so that's number two. The third is the translation of new knowledge. 
basic discovery to the bedside and then from the bedside to the population um, is way too slow. Um, we, we, need to, we need to be much faster. Uh, in, you know, depending on what you read, it's some place between 15 and 17 years. We need to do a much better job of getting new knowledge practicalized and out usable uh, uh, by people. So you, you could call that translational research. Or, um, and and uh, there, we already have a very good program in the CTSA that is, is training people, uh, not so much students, but training young faculty as, as we speak. So that's number three. The fourth area where I think the health system is broken is, is in the huge disparities in care that is, is provided a, across the globe. And, you know, I have people say to me regularly, why, why should we worry about doing something in Peru or Tanzania or Rwanda? We got our own problems right here in River City and in the U.S. I totally un understand and agree, and agree with that. But uh, with, within a decade, what's going to happen with health care internationally is the same thing that's happened with the economy. Twenty years ago, when there was an economic meltdown in pick your favorite country, Brazil, uh, Germany, Greece, it didn't really affect us. There's an economic meltdown in one of those countries today, and it affects us dramatically. You saw, you saw what happened in Greece. You saw what, what happened in Spain. You see what may be going on in Italy. Uh, it, it's in, in our best interest as Americans to have stable economic and political systems in every country to, to the extent possible. Um, and I think the same thing is going to happen in healthcare. We're approaching uh, the point where, if we have uh, tremendous disparities in health in other countries, it's it's not going to be in our interest. Now, that sounds like a selfish perspective, um, and and I certainly think that um, my own position on this is we have to provide opportunities for our students to learn in different contexts. And one of the things that Geisel, I would like to see us be known for in 15 years after I'm long gone, is, is that's a medical school that offers opportunities to prepare students to become um, skilled in delivery science or global health or translational science um, or cutting edge education. And so those would be the four tracks that, that the students could, could choose from. Now, the delivery science one is, is up and running. We would just sort of steal from TDI and, and, uh, and, and use those faculty to teach our students. The, the uh, translational science one it, with Alan Green's uh, center is, is pretty up and going. Uh, we need to recruit some more people in global health, but we've got five really good programs right now that offer students on-the-ground experiences where they can actually do more than just tourism. They can actually go into a country and work on a project and make a difference. Uh, you know, the learning one, the you know, cutting-edge medical education, you know, we've got some pretty cutting-edge people in this room, and uh, to your point, uh, one of the things that the new uh, uh, APT document offers is a way for faculty to get promoted by doing something innovative in education. I think we're one of the few places that offers that. So you don't, the, the way you get promoted in most places is, you know, the old, I got to have two R01s, six papers in Nature, and three in the, the Journal of Existential education and technology. Um, that's, that's just not feasible for anybody except our basic science people. That, that'll still be the way they, they get promoted. But we now have opportunities for faculty, you know, the more clinically oriented faculty, to get promoted for doing something innovative in education. I think what, 
what you guys are doing right here fits that bill. We have opportunities for people to get promoted for doing something innovative in quality and safety. That's in the document. It's been voted on and approved by the Board of Trustees. So these new opportunities, I think, are good for faculty because the message it sends is we value all sorts of contributions. We value contributions to teaching. We value contributions to research. We value t contributions to clinical quality um, and, uh, and even, even entrepreneurialism. So um, as, as, the, as we get, uh, you know, the new president is here, and I've met with him twice, and as we get closer to, to getting some, some granularity around the campaign, um, you know, I've been very clear with, you know, my people I hang around with um, on a day-by-day -day basis that I, I've got one, four of my big fundraising targets are in these areas. So we're going to be seeking a major gift, a naming gift for something like the Center for Health Equity. You know, at least 10 million, um, and hopefully more. We're, Rich knows we're going to be seeking a major gift, a naming gift for the Center for Innovative Medical Education. High priority. Um, we're going to be seeking a, a major naming gift to name Synergy. Synergy is what we call it, but there's no reason why we couldn't call it the Leahy Center for Clinical and Translational Sciences. So I'm trying to get Tim to make that. <laughs> that to, to, um, and, and um, you know, we're, 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 I think, probably quite likely that we could get a major naming gift for the Center for Healthcare Delivery Science. You know, right now we call it TDI. And we have this Dartmouth Center for Healthcare Delivery Science, but there's no reason why we couldn't get somebody who was very interested in that space to, to give us a, a, a big gift. So that, you know, these things will take time. There's a lot of cultivation that I have to do with, with board members, but part of my job is to deliver on those big gifts so we have sources of funding to, uh, you know, to do this. One other comment, and I'll, 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 I'll shut up because I've been long-winded. You know, um, Chris's point is a good one. The capstone project um, is, is for people who do a master's is important um, in, in that it needs to be real hands-on experience with dealing with these issues. So if we've got a group of students who choose the global health tract and they decide they're going to go to, I don't know, Peru, that's their, their place, um, and we've got a project there that is legitimate. It's supported by the Peruvian government. It, the, the dean down there is involved, the hospital's involved, the Ministry of Health is involved, wh whatever it takes f for it to be a legitimate project. I don't envision them going down there two weeks as a senior. I envision them going down there eight times over the course of their four years and partnering with people in Peru and doing really meaningful work. Now, we have to find a way to pay for it. But uh, a, the flight down there is not, not too expensive. Um, and we've already got a handful of families in Lima who let our students, both our medical students and our undergraduates, live with them for two months as part of their family. So, you know, it's not out of the question that we, we can pull this off. Obviously, the curriculum that your colleagues are talking about has to be flexible enough and adaptable enough. And so w you can see what we're starting to get towards is customized learning. That, that's, where, that's where education's going. I mean, R Rich will tell you that. You've, you've asked about, um, you've asked about, uh, um, can we do this in four years? Can we do this in five years? My, my opinion is that over time, we're going to have students do all this in three years because education is going to become much more competency-based you know, rather than time-based, right? My youngest, is a, my youngest is a sophomore here, and she'll take, I don't know, she takes, she took linguistics, which I've never taken. But you know, it's a 10-week course, 
and then at the end of the 10 weeks, you have a test. You know, you have some along the way. Um, but the, the fixed variable there is time. What if the fixed variable was competency, not time? Some students could master the competencies in six weeks. Others might take 12 weeks. So that's clearly where education is, is, is going gonna, is gonna to go. And we want to be right there uh, leading the way. Anyway, th I want to just echo what Tim and Richard said. I you know, really appreciate all your time and commitment to this. this th I think in the medical school, this is like potentially the coolest thing we could do in the next five to ten years. Thank you, Chip, and thank you to Carrie and to Pam for helping make this evening happen. Thanks, everybody, for coming out.